Okay, we've looked at human behavior, energy, money, technology, economy, growth, and the external impacts our system have on global heating, the oceans, and the environment. Now let's put this all together. I believe we are at a cusp in our species history where it's both possible and necessary to look at the really big picture. What follows in this video is my own synthesis but it's based on the work of many other scientists across many disciplines. It's not a cheerful story at first blush but it's a clarifying one. So many people your age and older are anxious, depressed, uncertain, and worried about our current situation. I believe understanding this situation is the first and necessary step towards mitigating the worst, adapting to what's ahead in creative and pro-social ways, and planting seeds for emergent cultural change in the decades ahead. Here goes. Okay, we live in a time of paradox. We've had a 12-year plateau in conventional oil production, yet the price is still under $60. U.S. oil production just hit an all-time high. We have widespread recognition of human-caused climate change, massive investments into renewable energy, but globally, carbon dioxide is still increasing at the highest rate in history. For the majority of people in the developed world, growth, measured by income after expenses, ended over a decade ago, yet stock markets are still at all-time highs. Everyone's somewhat worried, but no one talks about the actual threats and issues on TV or in public. We live in a time of myth. Demand for oil will drive up due to self-driving electric Uber taxis. We're going to begin manned space colonies by 2030 on Mars. The global economy will be growing at 20% per year by the year 2060. We will grow our economies, mitigate climate change, and solve global poverty and inequality using solar wind and smart grid tech. Humans will be extinct from climate change by 2025, and many, many more of such ideas. So, what is our most urgent challenge? Political dysfunction, climate change, ocean issues, overpopulation, pollution, species loss, social justice, poverty. Which of these things is the most important depends on someone's perspective and perhaps value system. But what if they're all related? Okay. We're going to first do a recap of the previous videos. Ecology. There are trophic pyramids in nature. Underpinning all levels is the energy from our sun. Animals, at different levels, optimize foraging strategies to access energy surplus. Organisms and ecosystems self-organize so as to better access an energy gradient. For example, a tree grows the exact amount of leaves that maximize its surface area in order to degrade incoming sunlight into photosynthesis. Okay, we learned about human behavior. Humans are adaptation executors, not fitness maximizers. We go through our days trying to attain the daily emotional states of our successful ancestors. Humans are among the most social creatures on earth. Because of that, we live as part of a system that suppresses the wants and needs of the individual for the greater goals of society, which nowadays are profits and quarterly earnings. As discussed in the time blindness video, we have steep discount rates and we prefer to consume rewards today as opposed to deferring them to the future for good biological reasons. Okay, the energy money economy section. As discussed in those videos, our society generally misunderstands the origins and reasons for our current vast wealth. We are energy and resource blind. Every single good and service that generates GDP requires an energy input. We've gotten slightly more efficient over time, on average about three-tenths of a percent per year, but globally energy and national income are tightly linked and will remain so. Relative to 200 years ago, we have massive extra calories added to our global system from fossil carbon, gas, oil, and coal, which we pull out from the ground to boost our labor force, powering our machines, technology, and heavy industry. This has led to a 14-fold increase in global income since 1800 and a 24-fold increase in income for the average American. This fossil carbon is not unlimited, and we've already found and used the cheapest and easiest. 
There's plenty left, but it's more costly in energy, dollar, and environmental terms. And finally, since energy is so ubiquitous in the processes that underpin our daily lives, everything gets more expensive if energy cost goes up. This will be a theme that we will become well aware of in coming decades. Okay, so those are some of the fundamentals. So what happened? How did we arrive at this place with all the issues we're currently facing? For 290,000 years of our species history, we were roaming bands of 100 or so people in Africa. Around 10,000 years ago, the climate warmed, glaciers receded, and in no fewer than five places on Earth, humans started agriculture, which led to villages, cities, and eventually nation states. This new phenomenon of agricultural surplus allowed some members of society to do jobs unrelated to agriculture. It doesn't seem like it, but this would be the critical shift in human behavior, organization, and impact. For most of history, humans appropriated primary capital from nature, turning it into useful things as secondary capital, and then having some sort of monetary marker, gold, beads, wampum, eventually money, that acted as a lubricant for commerce. Groups of people self-organized to maximize this surplus, usually tethered to physical output like grain. In the same way that a tree grows leaves to access sunlight, human societies self-organized around this energy surplus. Ronald Wright, in A Short History of Progress, writes, What took place in the early 1500s was truly exceptional, something that had never happened before and never will again. Two cultural experiments running in isolation for 15,000 years or more at last came face to face. Amazingly, after all that time, each could recognize the other's institutions. When Cortes landed in Mexico, he found roads, canals, cities, palaces, schools, law courts, markets, irrigation works, kings, priests, temples, peasants, artisans, armies, astronomers, merchants, sports, theater, art, music, and books. High civilization, differing in detail but alike in essentials, had evolved independently on both sides of the earth. Okay, Recall that we are walking forward in today's novel cultural and technological environment, but our brains are still looking backward, executing adaptations we inherited from our successful ancestors. How this manifests today is something like this checklist. Do you want to be 10 degrees or 65 or 110? Do you prefer everyone to like you or to be ostracized? Do you, would you rather be rich or poor? How many children do you want? Zero or greater than zero? Would you prefer newspaper, dial-up, DSL, or broadband? Would you prefer to be miserable or comfortable? If you need to be in town uh, in a short while, would you drive a car or walk or take a bike? Would you prefer to be as more or less successful than your neighbor? Do you care about more how your life is today or 10 years from now? Would you prefer to win a war or lose a war? What do all of these preferences have in common? They require energy, and more energy is generally preferable. So when resources started getting less available or more costly, we could continue our access to them by creating credit. The resulting amount of credit globally has grown by a larger amount each year than our economies have for the last 50 years. This dynamic of consuming today what we couldn't really afford without credit applies to individuals, to countries, as well as to actual resources. This conceptual graph shows how a normal resource pool, for example oil, might change when people can borrow money to spend on complicated technology to access more of the difficult portion of the resource. It does increase the total size of the resource, but it also increases the rate at which it depletes after it begins its decline. Okay, so let's fit all this together. Recall human energy history over the past 200 years, a story of adding more energy sources to the mix, growing GDP, and continuing upwards. Let's take a closer look. Our gregarious natures, when combined with modern technological inventions and an ample power supply, caused the emergence of institutions and structures that were optimized for growth. Up until the 1970s, we merely expanded the boundaries of our physical world, using these very high energy gain fuels and open lands. But that model ran into limits with the OPEC and oil price spikes in the 1970s. 
Notably, real wages and genuine progress indicator, energy use per capita, and other metrics for the USA also peaked in the 1970s. The human economy then went on to two new pathways. Number one, globalization and the outsourcing of production and supply chains to their least costly areas. And number two, turning to credit to accelerate human consumption after the disconnect of money from the gold standard. With debt and globalization, we rapidly grew the size of the human energy spigot. This model ran into a brick wall in 2008. As the financial disconnect from underlying capital came crashing down, the bubble pricked by Lehman Brothers' bankruptcy. Since 2008, we've continued growing this energy spigot at a slower pace via central banks taking over the credit guarantee mechanism and general management of markets by governments artificially low interest rates, direct liquidity to institutions at risk, ongoing central bank balance sheet expansion, and government deficit spending. All of these quote-unquote temporary measures continue 10 years after the crisis began. Additionally, to keep this energy spigot growing, which gives citizens more preferential energy services, countries are changing their rules in order to gain more access. For example, the USA is changing its definition of intellectual property to recognize more GDP today versus allocating it to the future. Italy and many other European countries are adding prostitution and cocaine sales to their economic statistics to keep their GDP to debt ratio above the European Central Bank minimums. Okay, let's recall the murmuration of Starling example. Starlings as individuals follow three simple rules. Do what your neighbor does, don't get too close, fly towards the center. With all these individual starlings doing that, it creates an emergent property of these beautiful shapes, these murmurations in the sky. In a similar way, human individuals also follow a few simple rules. Number one, we cooperate with others, either in small businesses or corporations or at national levels, to gain access to energy and monetary surplus. Number two is we follow cultural rules of what behaviors are socially acceptable. And number three is we spend this surplus on fun, interesting, and socially approved things. The emergent effect of 7.7 .7 billion people following these simple rules is a globally connected network that functions like a real, live organism. This superorganism is fed by a global transportation system with gasoline and diesel acting as the hemoglobin. Viewed this way, the superorganism is always awake and always hungry as it expands delivery nodes for goods, services, and people around a larger and larger global network. So the puzzle pieces in the opening image reassemble into something that resembles a giant amoeba. The amoeba doesn't have a brain, but follows simple rules. Whatever allows it to access more throughput and this is all predicated on more energy. Okay, so what are the implications of viewing the world from this lens? Think about our urgent challenge list. Which of these is most urgent? It turns out that all of these issues are related and can be explained by this superorganism dynamic. So, what are the three main inferences of viewing our human economy in this way? Number one, physically, Global human society is functioning as an energy dissipating structure. Every single good or service consumed in our global economic system originated with a small fire burning somewhere on the planet. Second, behaviorally, global human society functions using simple tropisms akin to an amoeba. In effect, the larger the group of people, the less able it is to depart from the gene agenda which is tethered to energy. Viewed from this perspective, there is no one driving the bus of human civilization and plans, which if you read the news and interviews during the recent gathering of billionaires in Davos, this was kind of obvious. The gathered rich and powerful were lacking a cohesive narrative on what is happening and how to respond. Third, thus issues like population, climate change, ocean risks are downstream of human economies optimizing GDP. Many of our environmental issues are a byproduct of the metabolism of this superorganism dynamic. Asking voters to keep carbon in the ground 
based on how powerful it is and what it provides to our societies, is behaviorally akin to arguing with a forest fire. Okay, back to these conceptual graphs. For much of the last 100 years, the black line, which is our monetary representations of reality, tracked closely with our real energy and material situation. So it's understandable that people expect this line to continue higher. And indeed, most leaders and institutions are planning on this. All key decision makers in the world are expecting growth to continue. But we're using that black line, which is credit and monetary creation and the stories that support it, to temporarily increase the red line, which is our non-renewable finite resources. There is no credible institution or government body or corporation globally that is specifically planning for an end to growth, despite growth in income and wages being over for over 80% of the developed world. So we, as a global culture, are kicking the can of growth. This is an emergent property of 7.7 billion of us following simple rules. We're not bad people. We're just alive at a time where our collective impact is now quite large. We're functioning as a super organism. In order to maintain populations access to current or even higher levels of consumption and experiences, we're now using increasingly risky strategies, including rule changes, subsidies, and especially credit. We are now growth constrained and will kick any and all cans forward to keep growth going. What cans are there left to kick? What will happen when we've kicked the can as far as it will go and is now blocking the road? The social and economic recalibrations related to this phenomenon will change education, philanthropy, institutions, and societies. So under this framing, what is not likely to happen? Growing the economy and mitigating climate change and the mass extinction is unlikely. Growing the economy by replacing fossil fuels with renewables is unlikely. We can add renewables to the mix, but not subtract fossil fuels. Humans en masse choosing to leave fossil carbon in the ground is unlikely. Governments embracing limits to growth before limits to growth are well past is unlikely. Okay, sorry for the flurry of slides and concept. Many of the logical pieces that build into this story are very hard to convey in a short soundbite, but this is the gist of it. We're not evil or flawed or any worse or better than any generation of our ancestors, but we're approaching 8 billion strong and the collective living of our lives combined with a massive pulse of fossil sunlight has caused us to self-organize into a culture that is no longer sustainable. And even if it was, it's having significant impact on the natural world. So how do we think about this predicament? What comes next? And what do we do about it? 